So, by the time you're seeing this, Street Fighter V will be out, which is the latest and greatest fighting game from Capcom's storied franchise, and it got me thinking a lot about fighting games from days of yore. Fighting games have always been one of my favorite genres, even though I've never really been that good at them, but I've always really liked trying them out, no matter how weird or offbeat they were. So that's why today I want to talk about one of my favorites from back in the day, Toeball No. 1 for the Sony PlayStation. Toeball No. 1 was developed by Dream Factory and published by Squaresoft, yes, Squaresoft, the RPG guys, with Sony Computer Entertainment for the PlayStation in 1996. It's the first game by Dream Factory, who would go on to become known throughout the late 90s and early 2000s for their fighting and beat-em-up games, including one of my favorites, The Bouncer for the PlayStation 2. Toeball No. 1 is a fully 3D one-on-one -on -one fighting game, with one of its most notable features being the ability to move around the ring in three dimensions. A lot of 3D fighting games at the time still restricted movement to a two-dimensional plane, making Toeball's freedom of movement stand out. Like most fighting games, Toeball No. 1 squeezes the bare minimum of a story into it. The game takes place on the planet Toeball in the year 2027. Toeball is rich in an ore called Molmoron, which can apparently be used as an energy source, and the winner of this fighting tournament earns the right to it. All of this is only told in the instruction manual, so the game's references to Molmoron won't make much sense if you haven't read up first. Hashtag get the Molmoron. The wacky story gets a suitably wacky cast of characters to go along with it, all designed by the legendary manga artist Akira Toriyama. As a fan of Toriyama's work, it really bugs me when people say his characters all look the same, so I'm happy to say that Toeball No. 1 features some of his coolest and most unique designs that I've seen. You've got main hero Chuji, Demon Man Ilgoga, Heroine Epon, Crazy Robot Home, Strong Grappler Mary, Quick-Footed Grin, Chicken Man Olimes, and Agile Old Geezer Fei. It's a super diverse cast, and I love their designs. I mean, look at O-Limes. Ask yourself, do Akira Toriyama's character designs really all look alike? They do not. O-Limes, man. Unlike Capcom's 2D fighting games that feature three punches and three kicks, or the Tekken games where each button controls a different limb, Toeball's fighting style employs a button for high, medium, and low attacks, with special moves being performed by combining a button press with the tap of the D-pad. You also have a button for blocking and for jumping, and holding the block button and pressing medium attack will grab your opponent. The grapple system is really cool. After you grab an opponent, you can move them around and perform different melee attacks or throws, which change depending on if you grab them from the front, side, or from behind. They can fight out of it or even reverse the grab, which makes it a nice risk versus reward aspect. Since you can win via ring out, pulling off a throw near the edge can end a fight very quickly. Not content to just offer a basic fighting mode, this is published by Squaresoft after all, Toeball No. 1 also offers Quest Mode, a behind-the-back dungeon crawling mode. This is the only way to unlock the game's bosses, but let me tell you right off the bat, it's not easy. While Toeball No. 1's controls work great for a fighting game, they do not translate very well into a 3D action game. Even basic things like turning is a chore, so when it comes to jumping over gaps, forget about it. To make things even worse, there are potions scattered throughout the dungeons that have random effects you won't learn until you try them. If you drink a red potion and it lowers your max health, hey, too bad for you. These are even randomized every time you enter a dungeon, so if the yellow potions are safe one run, they might not be the next. Completing the dungeons will let you unlock the game's three bosses. Mufu, Snork, a smaller version of the gigantic Nork. Snork, small Nork, get it? and Udon, as well as my favorite unlockable character from any game ever, Toriyama Robo. For those not in the know, whenever Akira Toriyama draws himself, he draws a funny little robot with big black eyes and a weird nose-mouth thing. Playing as Toriyama Robo in a video game is super fun for a lifelong fan like me, but unfortunately, unlocking him is next to impossible. To unlock him, you have to complete Udon's dungeon, a 30-floor dungeon full of mazes, dead ends, and relentless enemies. And if you die at any point, it's over. You can't continue. It's back to the beginning to try again. So I am not ashamed to admit it. I had to use a game shark to unlock him, because I am only a human being, I am bound by my weak, fleshy form, and I cannot stand up to Udon's dungeon. And now, you don't have to either, because I've uploaded this save file in a PS3 format up to my web space, which I'm going to have a link to in the description below, which is my gift to you. 
And hey, if you have one of those PS3 memory card adapter things, you can even put it back on your PlayStation 1 memory card. So you, there's, there's options, is what I'm trying to say. So quest mode aside, Tobal number one plays fantastically. The controls are responsive and the fighting is quick and fluid. While it doesn't show in this video, the game runs at a smooth 60 frames per second, so everything just looks amazing. The character models themselves remind me a lot of the first Virtua Fighter, being composed of untextured polygons. I still think they look pretty good though, and Toriyama's designs translated surprisingly well. And believe it or not, one of the strongest aspects of the game is the soundtrack. Boasting an all-star lineup of composers with Masashi Hamauzu, Kenji Ito, Yasuhiro Kawakami, Noriko Matsueda, Junya Nakano, Ryuki Sasai, Yasunori Mitsuda, and Yoko Shimomura lending their skills, Tobal No. 1 has an incredible musical assortment. The songs all have a hard-edged electronic feel to them that complement the action extremely well and make for great listening even away from the game. Even if you don't want to give this game itself a try, do yourself a favor and check out the soundtrack. Tobal No. 1 was even followed up with a sequel in 1997, appropriately titled Tobal 2. The bad news is that it was only released in Japan. Squaresoft decided not to localize it due to poor sales of the original game, as well as believing those that did buy it only did so because of the included demo for Final Fantasy VII. It's a real shame, too. You can play as a chocobo in Tobal 2. So, like every game I talk about on this show, Tobal No. 1 is not going to cost you very much money, although the price does seem to vary pretty wildly, and I'm not really sure why. Sometimes it's just the disc, the game did come packaged with a Final Fantasy VII demo disc, and that can have the price go up, but I've seen copies with the demo disc go for like $10, and some without it going for up to $20. So just keep an eye out for a good deal. I mean, you don't really need the Final Fantasy VII demo disc, you already know how that game turned out. I mean, my copy is just a loose disc that I found in a box at Hollywood Video when I worked there, so as long as you get the game, you're good. Even though it's hard to recommend a fighting game that doesn't have a scene around it, especially with so many competitive games on the shelves right now, Tobal No. 1 is still a fun game to mess around with today. It still plays great and the style still holds up. Like I said, I love the character designs and the soundtrack is, as the kids say, off the chain. I had a blast getting it back out and diving back in. So if you're a fan of fighting games, or even the old days of Squaresoft when their games still had personality, Tobal No. 1 is definitely worth picking up. Thanks for watching, and remember, love games, love yourselves, and love each other.